Thanks, Sophie. Welcome to the programme. I'm Ellie Crissell. A stark warning in Sussex that council services may have to be slashed. Remembering Matt, a memorial is unveiled in tribute to Sussex rugby coach Matt Ratner four years after he was shot and killed. Surviving Suicide, a moving new film, explores the power of connection in improving mental health. Just ring, ring one of the helplines, speak to somebody, keep that conversation going. And motoring manoeuvres, why residents in Hastings want to put the brakes on learner drivers. Hello there. First tonight, frontline services may have to be slashed. That's the stark warning from East Sussex County Council, thanks to what it says is a huge funding gap of more than £55 million. It says rising demand and costs, coupled with a reduction in government funding, has left it with the most difficult financial outlook it's ever faced. A range of services are in the firing line, from day centres to training support for people with learning difficulties. Claire Starr has the latest. A stark and urgent situation. Frontline services on the chopping block as East Sussex County Council tries to balance the books. Pockets of deprivation, the county's economy and an ageing population all contributing to budget pressures. The severity of people that come into care now, uh, their needs are much greater than they were years ago. Uh, their expectations are rightly uh, uh, more than they were before. And so providing those services add you know, extreme cost. Among the proposed cuts, the closure of Linden Court in Eastbourne, a day service for people with learning disabilities. All right, sweetheart. 23-year-old Jack Huggett is non-verbal and autistic. He's been supported by the centre for 18 months. It's, it's vital. Yeah, it's vital. It's, it's, it's his life. If you take Lyndon Court away, it's all he's got is here. Jack will become housebound. My life will shut down totally. The council say they'll instead find places in Becks Hill or at other providers. I, I'm a support worker myself. I'm on the minimum wage. So we, we don't even know if we're going to be able to manage to take him to Bexie. Also on the list, day centres, drug and alcohol recovery services and housing support, all at risk. In Uckfield today, concern over the future of services. I wouldn't want to see them stop a lot of the children's services, especially for special needs children. They should make other savings from somewhere else, not against the local services. Well, look after us. Don't cut things. The proposals are a double blow to people in Eastbourne, where the Borough Council is already closing the Beachy Head Story Heritage Centre and reducing funding for the Towner Gallery, as it tries to save another £2.7 million. We need government to support us out of this. Uh, we need local councils to be funded properly. These are the most vulnerable people in our society. We need to make sure that them and their services are protected and that is why I will fight for them and urge the government to properly fund local government. The government says it will fix the foundations of local government and work closely with the sector to do so. Tomorrow, councillors will decide whether to take the proposals to the next stage, asking residents to have their say. But for those reliant on those services, their future tonight seems uncertain. And Claire's here. Claire, it's not just East Sussex Council that's having to make some difficult decisions. Indeed, yes. Potential cuts and budget pressures aren't unique at all to East Sussex. It's something we've been hearing from councils across our area over the past weeks and months. In Kent, for instance, the County Council says it needs to make savings of £81 million in the next two years, with warnings that further tough choices will need to be considered. In February, Medway Council asked the government for exceptional financial support to avoid effective bankruptcy. It was facing a £35.8 million black hole this year. And in West Sussex, the council says that even if it increases council tax by the maximum amount allowed, it will still face a deficit next financial year. It's predicting a budget gap of £30 million. 
And finally, Brighton and Hove City Council is also rattling its piggy bank and says its potential budget shortfall is more than £105 million over the next four years. But tomorrow, all eyes on East Sussex County Council as it discusses what it describes as the most difficult financial outlook it has ever faced. Ellie. Claire, thank you very much. Boxer Anthony Joshua has been fined more than £750 for speeding in Lewis. He was caught doing 44 in a 30 limit on the A26 on the way to a training session. He says he deeply regrets making the error and has offered his sincerest apologies. Two men have been jailed following a violent burglary in Seaford. Remy Cadere and Romeo Dankwa, together with a 15-year-old boy, got into the house in Coxwell Close in January and, armed with a knife, assaulted a man. They then stole bank cards and cash. Their car then crashed following a police pursuit. The men from Hackney were sentenced to three and a half years. A memorial stone dedicated to a police officer who was shot and killed on duty has been unveiled exactly four years after his death. Sergeant Matt Ratner, who was the head coach at East Grinstead Rugby Club, was murdered by a suspect at a custody centre. His family were at the ceremony today in Croydon, from where Thomas McGill sent this report. A traditional Mary dance, all part of today's tribute to Sergeant Matt Ratna, who was shot and killed inside a police custody suite four years ago today. His partner Sue described the gathering as a celebration of his life and sacrifice. Today is all about honour and celebration, but also filled with sorrow. Matt was a unique man, and to have known Matt was a privilege. The kind, thoughtful, genuine man who had time for everyone and anyone. Joining friends and colleagues was Matt's son, also a serving police officer in Australia, who spoke of his father and other police officers' courage and bond. Life has a way of leading us to moments we couldn't have foreseen. But today I stand not, as a, not just as a son but as a fellow police officer. The unique bond shared by colleagues in this line of work is like any other. And it's those friendships that become the foundation of why we continue to do what we do. Welcome to East Grinstead Rugby Football Club. Matt, Matt had Ryan. many friends in and out of the force and was passionate about rugby and spent a lot of time at East Grinstead Rugby Club. Friends today who like set up the Matt Ratner Foundation say it was something he always wanted to do. There was a massive hole that was left after Matt departed. Um, but uh, one of his intentions was to start some local community programs to help people at the local schools get more involved in rugby. And uh, the foundations worked tirelessly in making that happen. He used to be able to make kids feel that they could add to the team, that they were honestly better than maybe they really were. And he just had that great ability to get, to get the best out of people. I, I think the same in his work as well. Today was spent paying tribute to a man who was a friend to all and an inspiration to many. The memorial will be moved to outside the custody suite where Matt fell, a lasting reminder of his sacrifice. Thomas McGill, BBC South East Today. A man accused of rape on Brighton Seafront has told a court that the interaction he had with a 16-year-old girl was entirely consensual. Joseph Eubank from Hove was giving evidence at a trial at Lewis Crown Court, denying the allegations against him. Next, two survival stories from those who have come close to suicide. A moving new film explores how talking and listening can play a key role in recovery for those experiencing isolating conditions and dark thoughts. The documentary reunites several people who took part in a suicide prevention project in Folkestone five years ago and how, through connecting with others, they found their way back. Hannah Rowe reports. Do you actually want to die? Or do you just want to get away from the pain? How do you find your way out of suicidal thoughts when it feels like the walls are closing in? Well, that's what these people managed to do. Five years ago, they took part in a film where they shared their stories. Now a new film has brought them back together. 
so much as my life has changed. It was really valuable to me to meet with people and sit and feel genuinely listened to and that what I was sharing was, was uh, important. The film looks at their move into a better mental state and a better life. How talking about their feelings made all the difference. I feel I've grown since the film. It was a bit of a life marker. I've written a book, a mental health recovery manual, based on my own experience of recovering from suicidal thoughts and plans of being very mentally ill. It's thought that one in five people experience suicidal thoughts. While 74% are comfortable talking with friends and family about their mental health, only 45% are comfortable sharing feelings of suicide. We need to start talking about a taboo subject. We need to actually check in with each other. We know things are difficult, people are struggling, but we as a community can actually support each other, check in with people, be ready for a difficult answer maybe, but actually the earlier we kind of have that conversation, the better the outcome potentially. I think it's very important to talk about suicide, life problems. The film aims to show how sharing those feelings with others is crucial to well-being. You don't just get over something, it is with you. So how do you live having gone through this and continue? So it's not sort of one minute you're in a really dark place and the next minute you're skipping through fields. Actually, life is up and down and it's about resilience and how we keep going. I am relieved that I didn't do it. I'll be totally honest there, I really am thinking at the time with the suicidal thoughts that everyone would be better off without me. It wasn't the case. And I know it's scary to, to reach out like that. I understand that because I found it so difficult. But again, just by trying it, just try, just ring, ring one of the helplines, speak to somebody, keep that conversation going. You need to talk about it. So the message is clear. People will listen. You have to give them the chance to hear you. Hannah Rowe, BBC South East Today, Folkestone. And if you've been affected by anything in that report, you can go to the BBC Action Line website. A public consultation is underway into how Southern Water will make sure there are enough supplies to go round for us, its customers, into the long-term future. The Draft Water Resources Management Plan looks ahead from 2025 to 2075. Without the interventions it's planning, the company says we will run out of water within the next 10 years. Tim McMahon, Director of Water, says the plan is catering for three things. Number one, population growth. Population is going to grow by about 10% over the next 30 years. So we need to counter for that, which is about leakage and demand reduction. We need to cater for climate change. We have an extreme periods of wet weather and extreme periods of dry weather. And we need to be able to collect that water. And about 60, 70% of what we take the water from today is going to stop. We're not going to really use it to protect the environment. Well, our environment correspondent Yvette Austin joins us live from Chatham this evening. Hello, Yvette. So tell us more about what is in this plan. Well, it's big and it's wide ranging. This morning I was shown some work that's already going on at several water treatment works in Kent to make them more resilient for the future. New technology to take nitrates out of the water. That's a chemical found in farm fertilizers and pesticides that over decades had seeped down into the aquifer where much of our water comes from. With climate change bringing wetter weather, it seeps down more quickly. And so more upgrades to more treatment works needs to be done. Plus, looking in the much more longer term plan, there are some big projects that the company says needs to be done as things stand. For instance, a new reservoir in West Sussex, three water recycling plants for Kent and Sussex, that's recycling wastewater into drinking water, four desalination plants, three in Kent, one in Brighton, that's turning seawater into drinking water, plus there's lots of new mains and replacements and work going on in Hampshire too. I asked Tim McMahon what would happen if the work wasn't done? Well, we don't do that. It would impact the environment fundamentally, or we won't be able to supply customers with, with water. But I think it's important to note, we, we plan very hard and very intellectually in our water resource management plan. So for context, if, you, if those remember the 1976 drought, we're planning for something that's three times worse. And by 2050, something that's eight times worse. 
So we're really planning for the long term to protect customers' water supplies, but protect the environment and making sure the rivers are plentiful to keep fish and the ecosystem alive. One of the things you're looking at is tankering in water from Norway. I mean, that seems quite extreme. For the Hampshire area for four years, there is that potential that we may need that. But it's important to say that is very, very unlikely. For context, we're talking nine days in the last hundred years. So very, very unlikely to occur. So if I tell us more about that plan to, to possibly import water. That seems odd for a country that gets quite a lot of rainfall. Well, absolutely, it'd be in big tankers taken into Southampton and it would be for the Hampshire area only. But as you heard, they say it's highly unlikely ever to be needed. It's really because a water recycling plant is being built or will be built and finished in 10 years time. Once that's finished, there won't be a risk. But the Environment Agency really wants to know that there is a backup plan in the worst case scenario. Yvette, thank you very much indeed. Now, it's just after a course to seven, a reminder of our top story tonight. Frontline services may have to be slashed. That's the stark warning from East Sussex County Council, thanks to what it says is a huge funding gap of more than 55 million. Day centres and support for people with learning difficulties could be at risk. Also in tonight's programme... And with more heavy rain in the forecast over the next couple of days, there is the possibility of disruption and flooding, but it's looking drier but colder through the weekend. I've got the details coming up later in the programme. Now, hill starts, parallel parking, mirror signal manoeuvre. We were all learner drivers once, and where better than a quiet road to hone your skills behind the wheel? Well, residents of one such street in Hastings, though, are calling for an emergency stop to driving lessons. They say there are so many newbie motorists tentatively taking corners in Ashford Road, it's become a non-stop conveyor belt of nervous and dangerous learner drivers. As Chrissy Reedy reports, a steering group has been set up to send out the right signals and put the brakes on the situation. I told you to slow down, no, no, no. Whoa! Whoa! For Christ's sake! Remember this? Who could forget Maureen and her husband? She spent thousands of pounds learning to drive. And we've all been there. But in this part of Hastings, learner drivers are driving some residents round the bend. There are just too many. We all know that they have to learn somewhere. We've all learned to drive, but it's just inconsiderate to have so many at the same time. On the other side of the road, however, Roy doesn't know what all the fuss is about. Is one now, look. He's perfectly OK. He's driving along at a very nice, decent speed. I don't know where he's going to go, but never mind. But as long as they keep off of people's driveway, I, I don't care less. Some of the people living here feel the number of driving schools using their road is out of control. There is just too many of them. So today there was a meeting about the issue. No. I am angry because there's just too many. You know, I came out of my drive today to come here. There was five cars parked within 40 yards of my drive, all learners, all stationary. We had a job to get out, didn't we, Jean? I heard you use the word invasion, and I thought, wow, that's quite inflammatory. Yeah, well, that was, the, that was part of the discussion. I suppose, you know, this issue's been going on for a long, long time, but I think post-COVID, with the franchising of driving schools, it's just there's nobody, there's no one place where you can contact them and make the representations to. So the residents are feeling under siege. They are. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, their front rooms are being lit up by bright beams every five minutes in the, in the evenings. Their cars are at risk because they have parallel parking targets. Don has been teaching people to drive for 40 years, so we got a front seat to see for ourselves. It can be an issue. I've got no argument with them on that, but it's nowhere near as bad as they make out. These pupils have got to learn somewhere and we don't have many places to go to in Hastings. Residents here say they don't want to put a stop to driving lessons, but they do want to reduce the numbers of driving schools using their street. Chrissy Reedy, BBC South East Today, Hastings. 
within the last hour. It's been confirmed Crawley Town Football Club's manager Scott Lindsay has joined League Two side MK Dons. In his 20 months at the Sussex Club, Lindsay helped the team escape the threat of relegation and saw them gain promotion to League One. The club say they are looking forward to recruiting a new manager, which will be announced in due course. Now, Strictly, of course, is back, meaning Ellie Leach has only a few weeks left as the reigning champion. But the former Corrie star has already swapped the Mambo for murder as she sashays into Eastbourne and also Guildford to star in Cluedo 2, the next chapter, based on the classic board game. Its famous femme fatale, Miss Scarlet, comes to life in all her glamorous glory, played by Ellie. She's been talking to Ian Palmer in Worthing, where she's currently appearing. I knew that it was going to be hard, I didn't realise how hard work it would be and I knew it was going to be fun but I didn't realise how much fun I would have um, and that's what's amazing about the experience is it's kind of like a whirlwind but with Vito was just the most amazing experience and it genuinely for me was life changing um, and something that I will cherish for the rest of my life. I'll ring you like every day. Ellie Leach first captured the nation's attention playing Faye Windass, aged nine, on it's Coronation it's like Street. The world, is it? Exactly. She held the role for 13 years. The people there, especially the people who was in my family, you know, Sally Dinover, who plays Sally Webster, she's been on Corrie for years and years and years. And, she, like, you, obviously I love to be able to learn how to work from her because she's such an amazing actress and an amazing woman. We were hoping you wouldn't notice. When did you know? We hadn't any. Glenn, why did he start breathing? Ellie says she enjoys learning on the job. Having never acted on stage before, she's taken the role of Miss Scarlet in Cluedo 2 at the Connaught Theatre in Worthing. The comedy element is also physical comedy, so we have a lot of like gasps and oohs and ahs, and you kind of have to really feel that through the body. But it also gives you the freedom to kind of go crazy, and nothing seems too far, nothing seems too silly. The play runs until the end of the week before hitting Guildford and then Eastbourne's Devonshire Park Theatre in November. Having achieved so much for a young actor, what does Ellie want to do next? So at the minute, focusing on this and then who knows what what's to come hopefully exciting things fingers crossed it looks like a lot of fun time now for a look at the weather nina is with us nina we've got some flood warnings in the forecast yes some pretty wet weather to come over the next couple of days of course today it's been gray it's been damp our weather watcher pictures really summing up but the rather gloomy skies that we've had through the day today the rain has been quite heavy at times it's come and it's gone and of course it's really starting to mount up now through september in fact charlwood is already one of the wettest places in the whole country we have had nearly double the september September average and of course a while to go with the wet weather to come over the next couple of days and this evening some wet weather this is the current radar picture you can see rain to the west rain to the south as well that latest weather front will move through this evening but only to be replaced by yet more systems really through the day on Thursday and Friday as a result that Met Office yellow warning it's all falling on saturated ground so the potential for some further flooding it's a really messy system as well and quite large stretching down through France and in towards Spain and it only slowly starts to clear away through the day on Friday. The weekend will bring us something a little different but this evening's heavy rain is going to move away and then it is drier for a time into the early hours but the showers start to gather as we start tomorrow morning with temperatures of around 11 to 12 degrees. The showers will come and go through the day. Some heavy downpours, possibly thundery downpours mixed in as well. In between the showers, there will be some drier and brighter spells, temperatures lifted to around about 17 to 18 degrees. And through the evening, the showers just tend to clear for a time, but that Met Office yellow warning still running through Thursday night and into Friday morning, because you can see more showers, especially along the south coast. The rain on Friday is mainly focused during the morning, wet weather pushing its way further south, a cloudy morning as well. Once that rain starts to move away, the winds are changing direction. It is going to be turning much colder. So temperatures on Friday at around about 12 to 14 degrees. And whilst it's a little drier on Friday afternoon, there may still be one or two showers around. And a lot of the weekend is also looking drier. High pressure is going to build in behind that weather system. So by Saturday, 
some sunshine, a little cloudier on Sunday, but once again it's going to be dry. But there is more rain in the forecast through the day on Monday. But the big change for our weekend forecast is it's turning much colder, Ellie. Thank you very much, Nina. We'll keep an eye on the impact of that flooding. Thank you. Well, that is it for the moment from Nina and from me and from everyone. Miranda Shunke is back, though, with your late news update at 10.30. Bye-bye for now.